So uh, hello, greetings to all. Uh, Geshe hopes that you are healthy, he hopes that you are well, and he hopes that you are happy. And so today we will continue with our short meditations in terms of where we are in the series. We've been uh, looking at meditations on the six paramitas or six perfections, which are said to ripen one's own continuum, one's own mind. So in terms of where we have covered in the perfections or the paramitas, we have covered the first four. So that leaves two remaining in the series of six. And our conversation will be a brief presentation of these two remaining paramitas or perfections of concentration and of wisdom. So when we speak of the paramita or the perfection of concentration, of, co of course, concentration is abiding single-pointedly on one's object of focus, on one's object of meditation. But when that practice is infused, connected with the motivation of bodhicitta rooted in love, compassion, and so forth, based upon that vast intention, the practice of concentration becomes the perfection, the paramita of concentration. So Geshe is going to prevent, present it really briefly in the context of our uh, short video here, but then of course on your own, in your own practice, you can expand and make this as vast as you like. So when we speak of concentration, we are talking about single-pointedness, keeping the mind on something single-pointedly. So why do we need to achieve single-pointed concentration? Why is this important? Well, because we think about uh, the importance of being able to, when bringing forth an object of virtue, to be able to stay on that object of virtue in a steady way and to take that factor of steadiness or stability and apply it to all of the other virtuous objects one brings forth in contemplation. They say that um, in Lama Tsongkhapa says in his songs of experience that it in terms of what is able to guard the mind, the king of the practices that guards the mind is the practice of this concentration, this samadhi. Yeah. And so that means whatever object of focus one is remaining on with this power of concentration, that power is stable, stable like the king of mountains, Mount Meru. And also it means that whatever other sort of objects of focus that we want to bring forth in the mind, for example, love, compassion, bodhicitta, based upon our training and concentration, one will be able to bring those forth in the mind and with steadiness. So these are the qualities of a single-pointed concentration. And through this, we can understand why one needs to meditate on developing concentration. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of this concentration, then we can develop um, certain kinds of wisdom. For example, the wisdom of being able to differentiate things through differentiating different objects. Mm -hmm. 
On the basis of this wisdom of differentiation and being able to properly differentiate between any various objects, then one is also able to uh, greatly reduce the afflictions. Okay, so and then on that basis, having understood uh, this important things, then we will take the body and mind and just gradually put them into a relaxed state. Dimensions go be carried out. So, 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 and in terms of single-pointed concentration, what object do we want to use to bring forth concentration? We can think, in my life, in my mind, what is the affliction? What is the unwholesome thought which is giving me the most trouble? We think of the antidote of that particular um, affliction that troubles us the most, and its antidote is our object of focus in our concentration meditation. If our main obstacle, for example, is discursive thought, is mental projection, then the antidote to this is said to be the mindfulness of the breath. So one puts one's attention, one's concentration on the rising and falling of the breath in a relaxed way. As I'm breathing out, I'm aware I'm breathing out. As I'm breathing in, I'm aware I'm breathing in. So one keeps mindfulness on that. There's also a practice of counting the inhalations and exhalations of the breath as means of concentration. And then on the basis of developing that focus, one can gradually get rid of those discursive or projecting thoughts. And if one is particularly troubled by the affliction of attachment, one can contemplate unattractiveness by um, contemplating unattractive components or things. And then one can come to understand that the object does not actually exist in the way that it appears through this lens of attachment of the attached mind. So then similarly on the basis of that, then one can understand that that object of attachment, it arises due to uh, causes and conditions. And one can understand the causes and conditions that give rise to it. One can understand the root causes. And then one can see that it does not exist in this stable way that it does when it appears through that lens of attachment. Then when we come to this concluding thought which thinks that that object definitely does not exist in the way that it appears through that lens of attachment, we kind of focus single-pointedly on that conclusion. And similarly, if one is particularly troubled by aversion as an affliction, one thinks about the object, for example, the person that gives rise to that aversion, and in relation to that object, one tries to bring forth love, compassion, and so forth.
And then one thinks how that object of aversion that arises due to cause and effect, actually, it has been close to us at various times. It has been kind to us at various times. We try to cultivate this as an antidote. And then through kind of doing this analysis, once we come to that conclusion, oh, that object definitely does not exist in the way that it appears through that lens of aversion, we then focus our single point of concentration on that conclusion. And then, for example, if through our kind of introspection we see that pride, that pride is the affliction, is the delusion that is causing us the most trouble, then we can try to um, think of uh, various vast um, topics of which we don't know much about. If we think of, for example, the constituents, the list of the 18 constituents, and our lack of understanding of those, this can be an antidote to pride. And then when we see that in the same way that this mind of pride, as much as I have this within my mind, it causes me unhappiness and difficulty. It causes others unhappiness and difficulty. We think about the results of that pride and we think that now, from now on, I'm going to reduce this pride and I'm going to bring forth an attitude of honest respect for every being that I encounter. We meditate on that conclusion single-pointedly. And then similarly, if we are most afflicted by the confusion of ignorance, if we think about that, we can think about the antidote to that ignorance, which is a dependent arising. And the more we are able to focus on the un understanding that we develop of dependent arising, the more and more we can decrease and eventually clear away that ignorance. And if we want to kind of bring forth, sort of open up an understanding of this dependent arising within our mind, we can think, how are those things that make us happy, those happy experiences arising due to cause and effect? And how are those things that are difficult, those unpleasant experiences arising due to cause and effect? And we can see the dependent arising of cause and effect. So So if we can use our human life, our human intelligence in this way to sort of uh, recognize what those difficult, those troublesome minds are and to kind of target those and decrease and decrease those and then put, try to put on that basis our mind in um, the direction of what is virtuous, of what is wholesome, then we will be able to improve and improve. And if in this way, whatever difficulty, whatever suffering we experience in samsara, if we understand that it has a cause and we are able to direct our efforts to eliminate that cause, then it will have no way to arise. 
dies, right? It has nowhere to go. Oh, to cheat and dash and so so that it is in that the dim because I cheat as you might and she died. Yes, yeah. So Geshula said that um, we will end it here, and in this way, we kind of explain this practice of a calm abiding of concentration related to various objects, and then in the next installment, we will cover more about wisdom. Yeah, to cheat. Thank you very much.